Hello and welcome to this Code Rage session. This is Getting Practical with DataSnap. This is a, a hands on session where we'll be looking at a DataSnap demo. This is a, a demo application and a, a DataSnap engine actually that you can take away and use yourselves in your own applications but also is the, the basis of a reference point for some of the language features within Delphi and also some of the core features around DataSnap including session handling and uh, role-based authentication and, and so on. So um, we're going to be having a look at a multitude of things within this session and we are going to move reasonably quickly but off the back of this session there's also going to be a number of more videos produced over the coming months which you'll be able to pick up and understand more uh, around the demo and a number of the different language features in depth uh, we'll take certain aspects that we'll deep dive into uh, over the coming months. So my name is Stephen Ball and I'll be taking you through today's session. I'm one of the technical sales consultants for EMEA. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with me and uh, with the new videos that do come along uh, based on this session then please follow me at, on my blog blogs.embarcadero.com forward slash Stephen Ball and um, also do keep an eye out on my Twitter feed at Delphia Ball. So through this session we're really going to start off looking at the idea and um, where this idea came from and we'll look at the architecture behind the, uh, the idea and how uh, this has really been brought to life and uh, we'll talk about the concepts, uh, the kind of the, arch the architectural design really in essence um, that was used to help build this um, which is a, a business display um, system and we'll look through the, the project group there's a, a number of projects within a project group that make up this example from the server side, from the unit tests and from the client side applications and we'll really go through at a high level what those projects are used for um, so you know um, where you're kind of starting really and then we'll really get into having a look at the, the features within this, uh, this demo and have a look at it in action. So the kind of core idea behind this demo um, very much kind of came from, um, strangely enough, from a, a meeting we had with one of our partners within the UK. And they were talking to us about how through their sales team, they were telling us how they were actually selling uh, Delphi and Red Studio and C++ Builder and that they have uh, data that they're trying to collate together to help them improve their procedures through telephone systems, through sales forecasting, through the accounts data that was going through and what they really wanted to have was a way to be able to merge this data together and, and show it in a uniform way that really brought all the different data sources together. And I'm sure a lot of you are sat there going, well, you know, this isn't something that's particularly uncommon. Uh, we hear about this kind of thing in, in most of the projects that we work with. And, you know, I'll be quite honest with you, it's something I've kind of worked with a number of times in the past as well. Um, but we always kind of, kind of look at it and go, well, how can we actually kind of do this in a way that uh, really brings some value out of the tools? And um, you know, luckily there's there's some uh, architecture that we have within Rad Studio that really helps put this type of application together in a, a really fun and uh, and practical way. And you know, using uh, the kind of the cloud services within Rad Studio, uh, obviously we've got the Delphi and C++ Builder have access into web services which we've had since Delphi 6 um, and also with uh, uh, we have da uh, DataSnap that's been hugely improved over the last um, three or four years since Embarcadero took over the tools and DataSnap really brings a great way to connect in using JSON, using REST, using HTTP, using HTTPS and having all these different um, data connectivity routes in that are pretty much language agnostic. You know, you literally any language can go ahead and pick up these uh, this access in. And with the mobile connectors that came in within uh, XE2, 
um, with being able to connect in multiple different languages as well to the DataSnap servers. Uh, I thought, okay, well, actually, we've got a really strong framework here that we can write a demo with, and no matter what uh, language or whichever uh, access in that we need from these different systems, so whichever the telephone system or this accounting uh, data or the sales forecasting data, however they want to populate that data through, then we've got a very high level uh, access in that we can write some business logic into to take that data in. So obviously taking the data in leads us to where we're we going to put that data. Now, I kind of chose that a, a database would be the way to go with this project. And um, you know, I chose Interbase uh, for the pure reason that one, you get it along with Rad Studio, uh, two, it's an Embarcadero product. But on, on the main reason, it's very lightweight, it's, it's pretty fast, and it's very admin unintensive. Um, so if we're going to put something up on a cloud server, we don't want to have to go in and be optimizing it all the time. We don't want to have to go in and kind of really keep a close eye on it. Uh, we just want to put something there that's going to run and do its job well. And Interbase is an ideal candidate for that kind of thing. And also because we have an embeddable version of it, um, we can even deploy it out onto web servers where we don't have uh, a database engine installed anyway. So having Interbase is a good choice. We then look at being able to deploy it up to Amazon Cloud uh, or Azure instances. So great way to be able to deploy it up. Also, we're going to be looking at where we're going to consume this from. Now, initially, we're going to be looking at Windows and uh, we can then roll that over if we're using FireMonkey onto Mac. But uh, also coming forward in the future with the uh, mobile studio roadmap, um, we've got the advantage to be able to bring this over to iOS and Android using a lot of the same code that we have. And you'll see there's examples of shared units of code between VCL, between FireMonkey applications within this project. And we'll be able to take those units and also use those onto iOS and Android um, applications that we developed through Rad Studio uh, with Delphi or C++ Builder moving forward as well. Hey, I said there'll be some videos coming in the future along this. So thinking really around the data that's coming in, what is it that we're trying to show? Well, there's a number of different things around um, the, the sales team. So typically we've got different salespeople here and each of those salespeople are going to have their own targets depending on kind of the areas, the business areas that they look after. And we're going to want to see that uh, around the data that we're collecting on a day-to-day -day basis, be that the number of telephone calls they're making, be that the actual um, budget that they're trying to hit, and whatever it is. And we don't know that straight away and that's likely to change um, quarter by quarter or month by month or wherever their sales periods run into. So there's a number of different things that we're not quite sure what they're going to be, um, but they kind of loosely fit into the same kind of areas. And I was sat down watching, uh, I quite like Formula One, and I was sat watching the Formula One racing, and I was thinking, thinking, well, actually, this is pretty similar to the whole sales malarkey, really. You know, we've got different drivers um, instead of salespeople. And instead of having, you know, month or day or week or quarter targets, you know, they've got different races and each race is a, a target for them. They've got to try and achieve what they're trying to achieve through that race. Uh, so instead of collecting sales figures, we might be collecting lap times or fastest speed um, or their end of lap position. So there's, an, you know, different scenarios could bring different data in. And um, it kind of got me thinking around some core concepts and we actually refactored the initial idea that we had uh, a bit to bring in these three core concepts. So the three core concepts that we have are series, entity and attributes. So a series is very much days or quarters. An entity would be a salesperson or a team and the attributes would be uh, reportable attributes, so forecasting, targets, actuals, they could be numbers, they could be dates, they could be 
um, integers, they could be floating points, um, they could be percentages. Uh, we don't actually know up front what they're going to be, but there's going to be things that we need to record against. Now, if we relate that to racing, then uh, obviously we've got a number of races, we've got a number of drivers, and we've got a number of things that we want to record against those drivers for that race. And, and looking at these whole kind of relationships, we're able to start building up some rules that the, the business engine will work against. So for example, a series will contain a list of entities and attributes that will be recordable for that entity. And um, each attributes and entities may appear in multiple series, but do not always have to appear. So for example, if we have a race, we may have a race in two different cities. So we're gonna have two, two series, like London and Sydney, for example. And then within those races, there may be um, the same drivers, but there, almost, there may also be the case that you have one driver injured or is unwell. So you have a substitute driver comes in for that race. So you need to allow that there are different entities. And if you think of sales teams, we have the same thing, right? You have a sales quarter and you start off, you know who your salespeople are. Now partway through that quarter, somebody's going to leave, somebody else is going to join. Um, so you're going to have to be able to change the actual entities within a series and the following series the one who's left isn't going to be in there but the one who's joined will be and if you have a look at um, uh, in terms of what you want to record from a business point your management may say well, actually we want to record and focus on the number of calls that people are making this quarter um, to see if that makes any correlation to the amount of quotes they're sending out and so on so within the project group um, to help us uh, bring these kind of concepts together um, we've got very much going back to our architecture here we've got some server side we've got some client side and within the testing we're doing we've got some server side tests and then we've got some client side tests that test that the functionality of the communication layer all working as we'd expect and that then gives us uh, a very sturdy point to be able to program into. So we have a number of projects in here. Uh, we have our server side tests, which is BI unit test, which is our first project in the project group. And then we've got our servers, which consume the objects that we've written uh, and have tested. And then we have our client side BI client side tests and this project very much uses the communication layer we have here from our servers to actually populate objects through to the server and then recall them back to make sure we're getting back what we expect afterwards and then um, that kind of tests uh, the communication side uh, we also have our persistence level checked within the BI unit tests there's also our uh, with, actually within the persistence there's specific persistence objects that get tested in there as well so you can go ahead and look through those we then get down to our bottom three projects here and these are our client side applications now we've written these using FireMonkey to allow us to be able to move to WinMac um, you can also use the same code and share some of the code with a, a VCL application and in fact our server side application here are, are actually VCL applications using the same common objects um, that we're using on the FireMonkey client side and through our unit tests. So we have three levels of application and the real reason for this is to be able to show the different uh, role levels and the, uh, the fact that we have um, admin and uh, user and uh, I can't remember the other one, we'll have a look as we go through, but we've got three different uh, user types, roles, uh, and with the system admin, then the admin roles can actually change the data rather than just viewing it. On the data entry side, then we have the ability to enter the data for a user, and then it's a viewer is the other one. So the viewer can view the output, um, but can't actually enter any data in. 
Uh, and if you kind of think of the, if we go back to the business model that we had for the uh, the Formula One racing, as an example, then you could say, well, you've got the admins for Formula One who go and set up all the, the systems, and then you have the data entry done by the teams who have uh, who have uh, electronics within the cars to record their lap time and so on and so forth. And then you have the press and the people watching at home and everybody else viewing the output through multiple different output devices. Um, but they're a viewer level. So they're still accessing into the same system, the same back end, but we have the user security in there to manage some of that really cool um, functionality that's within DataSnap. So I said something about the uh, language features that we have within this project that we can have a look at. And there's a huge amount of language features, everything from basic loops and class inheritance, um, some very simple database express um, work. We've got some work around interfaces, uh, hooking into interface, some uh, beginner stuff with unit testing. Uh, we have some, you know, some of the common sorts like a, a bubble sort implemented within Delphi in there as well. Uh, and also some of the great documentation insight stuff showing how to use that and how that really helps bring your code alive when you're coming through it and sharing it amongst the team and referencing back to stuff later on. And we'll be deep diving into those in a number of supporting videos. We also have a load of class helpers. We have some generics in there. We have, uh, you know, we're accessing to the T dictionary. We're using the uh, T object list with typed um, constraints to make sure that we always have the same type of object return back from the object lists. We have, uh, as the class helpers are expanding functionality against uh, objects that are already there. Uh, we then start looking through at some things like anonymous methods and um, certainly from the FireMonkey point we start looking at how we can use the FireMonkey styles to dynamically have multiple different items within list boxes that look differently, um, showing us how we may not need to always use third party controls where we may have had to in the past, uh, which means we can keep to more common controls, um, but also uh, where we do need third party controls, really know what we're looking for uh, around what we need. Um, we also have uh, a look at the, the security roles um, within there as well. And then for the real advanced stuff, we start getting on to marshalling and unmarshalling through JSON um, core objects. Um, now, they're very easy to get up and use without knowing all the advanced stuff through the, uh, the demo code that's there. Um, but once you really start getting on, you can then start refactoring those objects and really kind of playing around with the marshalling stuff, which is really cool. Um, and also getting to understand some of the runtime type information that's been really well improved over XE, XE2 and XE3 and looking at uh, T value and getting to know that really well, uh, along with having a look at some of the really cool stuff that you can do with custom attributes. And uh, in fact, just kind of picking up on a couple of these things, we'll have a, a quick look in this session at um, how we can use FireMonkey styles and runtime type information to actually make some very dynamic forms that we can actually pass to any Delphi object, not only the ones in here, that will then give us an editor for using those objects. And we'll have a quick look at that in today's uh, session. And in fact, talking about that, here's a couple of screen prints of that in action. Uh, this here we'll have a look at as we go through. This is a list of objects that have been returned. And as we double click on the object, it actually uses runtime type information to in, uh, ins inspect the class type, get a, a hook into that class type, and we'll then be able to show the published properties and using the published property type, so if we've got an integer or a string, so this is an integer, these two here are strings, this is a bitmap, we're able to apply a style to a list box item, and this here is literally a list box with one, two, three, four items showing within the list box, and we'll see how that works uh, at runtime. And we can also see some advanced stuff with FireMonkey styles here with the the font colour changed on buttons just to be able to kind of give that clearer idea about a cancel and applying and so on. So let's get in and have a look at some of this running. 
so here we are this is our project group and um, to start off I'm just going to run our unit tests that we have in here and you can see here we've got some uh, unit tests that are down here that have all been uh, built up uh, we can get in and have a look at kind of uh, checks that are being run to make sure that objects are of certain object types and so on and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, we can see a whole load of those through here if you want to plow through those and feel free. And we also have our common folder. So if I just right click here, let's show this in Explorer. Um, we have within our demo folder, we've got some client applications, we've got some common, uh, we've got a database in there, there's um, some marshalling examples and some server uh, applications and some of our unit tests in here. So within the Clients, we also have a common clients folder where we see things for um, series helpers um, and some proxy connections and uh, some uh, object caching and stuff that we do in here as well that you can use in multiple applications. So really worth having a browse through the core objects here. But I'm just going to run uh, this unit test for the moment. This is going to run here on the local machine just to check um, that my connection's working. This not only tests the objects and the functionality objects but also does some integration testing with the database to make sure the database connections are working uh, and that the recall from the database is as we expect. Now we've got a few purple things here and we can see here this was expected true but was false and that's very much because um, this here um, is a test that's um, running within our um, uh, data object here. Uh, we know this was uh, implemented around um, uh, an image that we've not actually um, completed yet. And uh, so, you know, we've got a. So this one's the, uh, the testing the image here. Um, this is uh, testing some cache stuff that we just got to go and do. So, you know. Not complete unit tests, but certainly uh, a good solid start and enough to run through, but showing how to work your way through some of these as well. So that's our basic unit test working. If you can get those running, then you know your database connection is all sorted. There's a readme file in there that will show you how to set up your database connection. So once we've got the database connection going, I'm just going to run and launch our server here. And... Uh, We'll come, and ha we'll come back and have a quick look at some of the common code there in a moment. But uh, I'm just going to make sure my client side unit tests work first. So this is going to ask me for an IP address. So I'll just check IP config. And this is number 156. So let's change that to 156. And uh, admin at admin.com is my username. It's the same password for the admin user and we can see this is now running through our tests um, this is calling the server side methods that are exposed to our data snap server and uh, these have all passed which is great news so if we come back to our server very quickly and uh, let's have a look at our web module unit we can see here we've got our, um, our different session types for invocation, for server and for session uh, and these hook back to um, different uh, modules that we have linked in here and uh, linked off these we have our methods that are being exposed and called here so we can see here we've got the generate ID this has the role authentication stuff built in here so you can see we have the viewer we have admin and also user and um, we can see here we have the different uh, user role set up. So if we have a look at the update series, we can see here we've got a, a per persistence class that's been called, that's been passed the instance of our TDB series. And here you can see, just holding the mouse over, we're getting some code insight about these objects. And uh, we're going to have a quick look at that in a moment. But here we've just got some simple code that's getting a query, that's updating um, the the persistence object into the database by passing the query in and then releasing everything afterwards and this gets the result back to pass through so we've got some persistence objects in here we've also got our core objects been passed through so let's just go and have a look at our with control click and find declaration and um, 
we want this object here and we can see here we've got some remarks up against here and that's what's being picked up when we hold the mouse over for the code uh, insight uh, and this is really useful uh, example of using documentation insight um, which uh, up here tools documentation insight show documentation you can just literally park this in on the side and if you go to the design mode you can then start editing uh, your comments and your remarks as you go through your code so very easy to add your documentation in so anyway before I digress too far we've got our server side test working we've got our server running we've run our client side test to make sure that the server communication is working so let's go ahead and have a quick look at our clients and then we'll come back and have a look at the runtime type information example that we have on that single client so here I'm just gonna I can view my attributes entity series and my uh, series associations so let's go ahead and have a look at the attributes to start and I'm just gonna put the same uh, username in here for the password now this is going to go and load into the cache at the first point I load the uh, the attributes so in here I've got some uh, racing data and uh, for a little bit of fun we've got some fine monkey racing so um, we've got here different attributes for example lap 1, lap 2, lap 3 um, we've got uh, speed and time so we've got position 2 and then 3 and so on and I think you know, we've got a, a whole stack of uh, different laps so you could have a race up to 20 laps long and uh, each one of these has got their own little image and, uh, and so on and if we double click on one of these here we can see that the attribute has a number of published properties and this is a, a few more than uh, most of the, uh, the objects um, but we can see here we've got a bitmap we've got some strings, we've got some integers uh, we've even got some drop down lists with populated lists and this is using attributes uh, these are uh, Delphi attributes this time to mark up the property to tell us data that we need to know and we're using runtime type information to then be able to give us a drop down of the different values and what they map back to um, to be published back to the, to the, uh, the object and um, so we can come here let's say let's change this to uh, uh, display format 0.0, .0 um, or actually let's do something a bit different let's change this up to sort order uh, from 10 down to 7 we can uh, apply and close that here and we can see this now is updated and uh, we now have a save option which we can save our data back and if we close and reopen that data is then going to be persisted um, I can also go and kind of change this back if I want to um, we've got some scaling in here so we can see the, the different scaling going on so that's kind of cool but um, if we go and have a look at our series associations here we can see um, and this is just going to load up the uh, the other objects that have not been loaded in yet so this uses a, a client side cache um, and that does all the communication back through the proxy so you literally can just add that uh, unit in and um, and off it will go so here we can see we've got our associations for our entities and attributes we can drill down into those by dropping out those um, and we can go through those for the different races we can associate the objects that we want the different drivers and the different laps with the different races and uh, once we've done that uh, if we wanted to we can also come in here and um, if you want to use this yourself then it's useful to know you can add in your own um, custom object types so for example you can add in a screen or you could add in you know, whatever you fancy um, as custom object types and then under custom you'll then get a list of any additional types that you want and you can store an image, a name, an ID and a sort value which you can then start associating things with the, um, within uh, the application um, uh, within the engine should I say so anyway that's the configuration from the configuration if we come and have a look at the data entry uh, the data entry allows you to literally um, this uses user um, you can also use admin because that's a higher level but here if we go and select one of the races 
we'll then be able to see the uh, the laps and the drivers associated with that race. So we can see here we've got a list of drivers. If we move on to Beijing, we can see we've got some more drivers associated in. Um, we also end up with a, a different number of uh, uh, laps associated in here. So let's go ahead and um, uh, I'm just going to have a quick look through here. We've got some data populated in. So under lap times, we can see we've been using this grouping. So we've got uh, sector one, sector two, sector three, and sector four, uh, and then the complete time as well. So we can really start using the groupings um, to put kind of maybe day by day figures in. So another example would maybe be, uh, uh, you know, we've spoken a little bit about sp um, Scrum and having a backlog and within each sprint having different targets that you're trying to achieve and then having the burn down for each um, target within the, the daily values. There's a whole host of different things you could start using this engine for to then display data values back out the other end. So once you've got the data in, obviously you want to have a look at the data, right? So let's go run this here. And uh, I'm going to pick up guest at guest.com. And guest really allows us to, let's just go pick uh, a race here. We're going to go choose London because that's the closest one to me. And that's gone and brought us up. Um, this is showing groups of attributes. So one thing we didn't actually have a look at on the attributes, there's a grouping property. So you can say um, in a text group which groups they belong to. And then there's just a little bit of logic within this example to pick up the number of different groups and then show the first icon uh, assuming that each group has the same icon for it. So um, under the, let's just run back to our configuration here. Under the uh, attribute groups, um, we can see here that we've actually said, okay, uh, if we've got an attribute group called time, then we want to have a, 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 a lap times tab which has a certain type of chart in there and it's showing the uh, data for group 1, 2, 3 and 4. Uh, otherwise we're going to have a, a position tab which is going to be called race order and that's going to be stepped um, chart in a reverse format. And this is using the t-chart component uh, and we've got speed which is a top speed and line. So you can start putting in here, um, building up how you want the, the data to come out the other end. So here we have, we've got our stepped reversed. So you have to excuse the minus signs at the start, but basically position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So we've got the first one at the top, and then you can turn on and off uh, different drivers to see how they uh, progress through the race. Um, uh, and so on, So and you can hold your mouse over and double click on them to see who that was. So that kind of uh, is kind of fun. We can also have a look at our speedos, and uh, we can maybe actually say, well, let's actually view this as um, as a grid. So let's have a look at the uh, the data now in the grid format. So we can see that it's the pure data underneath it and how that's coming out. But this is very much a, a first example of how to kind of get going. And I've left one there for you to implement yourselves, uh, a lap times one, so you can have a play with that. Um, but uh, this really is just a, a first example of how to use uh, the engine. And uh, within here, as you say, there's the common objects, uh, the common files that you need to go ahead and, and just use. Um, there's some common, there's a read-only data cache, uh, which has got uh, methods to get the objects, to get the lists, uh, and return those back for you to work with, and uh, to get list by type and so on. So very easy to kind of work your way through uh, and pick the comments up from. So I did say we're going to have a look at that RTTI uh, example. So let's jump back into our, our configuration. And in our configuration section, we've got um, our object editor and let's go and have a look at our uh, under one of our common folders it's this one here let's have a look at our core business objects so we've got the entity data um, we've got our series uh, so yeah let's start with the series so we've got the 
um, the series, which is a, a T-base object. We've also got up here um, the attribute, and the attribute is probably the most interesting one to look at. This descends from TBD base object, and the TBD base object is our base object for everything which is up here. And this has got a name, it's got an image, it's got a bitmap, it's got an ID, it's using this BDA max attribute to be able to uh, tell the design editor when it pops up that it only allows 38 characters to be entered. The same for the name, it's a maximum of 100 characters. So we've actually got an attribute there we're able to pick up at uh, runtime and apply then to the edit. So we control click here, let's go find this. And we can see this has um, an apply to control method that uh, we're able to call, which basically looks for on the control object that's being passed through to it, uh, a max property, and it's then setting that value through, or max length, so it's checking for max or max length, and then setting that value into it, so you could have max number, or a max number of characters, and so on. And um, one thing that's really cool, that's worth having a look at in here, uh, and I haven't had a chance to show you, but um, we've got an edited property on the base object, now this edited property um, is builds a hash value and then just returns back if the hash value that's stored is the same as this value that's created uh, at this point in time, then we know it's not edited, otherwise it's edited. And the set edited uh, basically says is edited because we know that's never going to pass the hash, um, hash sum. Um, otherwise, if we set it to false, it builds the hash sum. Uh, so the hash value here is created using the runtime type information context. And we actually go down the different object types. And this uses the current class type. So this line here gets the class type of its object right now. So what's great about this is because it's picking up the published properties to build the hash value, even when you descend from this object, any new published properties you add will automatically get built into the hash um, value that's built. So you can then keep track of if that object's edited or not. And if you do edit it and then change the values back, it will say that it's not been edited. How cool is that? Um, so really nice kind of functionality with runtime type information really brings some powerful stuff in there. Um, here we've got the a different attributes that we're passing values into um, to build up. Um, here we've got some constants that are declared, um, then we're passing in string representations for those. Uh, and if we go back up here to this uh, class, we can see what the string values uh, mark back to is actually constants within a record um, for storing into the database. So on the, the final part of this, if we just jump back into the, the form that we started trying to uh, get to a moment ago, now we know a bit about the objects. On the form here, we're using a style book. And to do this, we added some uh, list box items and then literally uh, edited the custom style. And this built in here a number of different list box items, which we then literally just go and drag from the object inspector, controls into, set up the, um, if we go to the object inspector down here, we're able to, let's choose the, uh, the description here. And if we come down here, we can see we've got the style name, which is the description, and text for here, which is description at the moment. If we come into the value, and we've got that selected here, if we come down, we can see that our style name is value. And we literally use the same names on the different controls for the different object types. So we can then set the description to be whatever we want it to. And using the T value, we know that it's going to be called value that we can bind the property uh, back through to. So if we come in and have a look in here, we can see here that we're, let's just make a bit more space here. We're setting the, the description to be the style data for the current item. This is the uh, on update event for the object. So when we, we set the style name and the on object type, uh, we set the on object update style property. And that on update style property is then picking up from the style name that's been set and then is going down, finding what type of property has been set to this item, 
picking up the data, setting the attributes here to the items on the screen and setting the height if it's a, a, an image because we want it slightly bigger, running through the enumerated types, listing them in order and so on. Uh, and doing a whole load of work here to set the value, 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 whatever type it is, we know it's going to be a value. Um, so very easy code to then read through to then give us that really nice editor. Okay, so that was quite a, a fun look through. Let's uh, just kind of remind ourselves where we've been today. I hope you've really enjoyed that. Um, it's been a, a quick run through this data snap um, demo, uh, which shows how you can do multi-tier development that shows you how you can use different roles within DataSnap to really build something that's uh, very powerful for the real world. And uh, there's going to be load more tutorials coming out around this uh, demo, delving into some of the language features and bits that we've only skimmed over uh, in the last 40 minutes or so. Please keep an eye out on my blog um, for the updated videos and the bits coming along to support this. And uh, my blog link is back there at the bottom of the screen. And also the link for Code Central um, is uh, cc.embarcadero.com forward slash item forward slash 29091. So do go up to Code Central to download the code and uh, have a play with it now. So thank you very much for watching and um, time for a bit of Q&A. So the most common question is, where's the, where, where's the code? Where can I get the code? I need the code. I 29091. Want... So there you go, cc.embarkado.com slash item slash 29091. You can paste that in if you want. Uh, I wanted to go back, Stephen, that, you know, in the previous session, which had an HTML5 builder client mm -hmm. talking to a data sub server, people were asking about, you know, JSON, about JSON packets, about encoding. Uh, other types and so on. Maybe you want to add to that conversation. I, um, one of the attendees asked, well, what about, you know, big data, you know, bitmaps or other streams of data and, and how to handle it in a data snap server and client? Yeah, um, I think the, the one thing that you mentioned, obviously, um, and has ran into before is that if you automatically stream big chunks of data all the time, then you can have a, a reasonably unresponsive server. So um, when you're trying to make something scale, you're best to feed it when you need it. And um, you know, one of the things that you can do is when you and you will get points that you do need to feed that data down um, is to uh, you can serialize things as dynamic byte arrays uh, and push those through. There's actually some uh, really good examples to do with marshalling. Um, and uh, within the actual the demo code there, we actually take uh, the object and the re you know, probably in a, a true thin client sense, I should have extracted the image out of the base object that I had, um, but it's kind of demo code to show different language features really. So um, we actually have the image as part of the, the core base object. Um, and that actually uses uh, marshalling. So you have a, a marshalling object in there that tells the JSON packet how to convert it into JSON as it's being created. And then on the other end, there's the kind of unmarshalling back um, element of it that then tells the code how to convert this um, data back into the object. So it converts the object into JSON and then from JSON back to the object um, on either side. And that way you can then send the entire object down through Datasnap from the server down to the client. I think another area when, when you're, when you have a Delphi client or C++ build client, one of the things in Datasnap you can do is we have this technology called heavyweight callbacks where you can open a channel between the client and server and send whatever you want, um, mm -hmm. any forms of data. Uh, back and forth between the two of them. You can also register callbacks so the client can tell the server, call me back when you have something, like if you have a long-running query, but using heavyweight callbacks, you can open a channel and pass whatever you want. I, I, the thing I was referring to, I think, back in the case of for a web browser kind of application to, with HTML5 Builder, is that you know web browsers already know how to fetch other stuff as needed, right? as they bring parts mm -hmm. of rendering whole page. Uh, which is a little bit different, uh, although, again, if you've got to pull a lot of data, you could register a callback from your data sub client to your server, and when the server's ready, it can start sending you stuff. So there's lots of different options and architectural options, uh, depending on what the clients are, 
And of course, with data snap built in Delphi or C++, those things run on Windows, Windows Server, uh, their native code, uh, wholly contained application servers that use the ports that you mentioned. You have your choice there as well. Um, I haven't spent any time with LDAP. I mean, we use it. We have LDAP servers here for authenticating all sorts of stuff. But Alf is asking, is it easy to use LDAP for user authentication uh, in a data snap server? Um, I guess it's as easy as using LDAP anywhere else. Yeah, um, the, the thing, yeah. Um, obviously, one of the nice features within a data snap server is obviously the, the role-based authentication. So all you'd need to do on the server side is as the user's logging in, you can then generate something up to say, well, this is the user rights that they have within my data snap server. So you code in the different user levels that you have, um, however you'd want to do that if it's um, dynamically or you know, statically into your code. And then you'd need to do some registration back to the ADIP server to ask for the groups that that person belongs to and, and pull that through just in any other way that you would normally do if it was a, a local application. Um, but there's obviously there's the three states on the server. There's the, the server, there's session and invocation. So it probably makes sense if you've got a, a data snap server is to do that once, store that in the session, uh, and then you've got that data there, or just cache it somehow within your system so you don't have to constantly poll. Um, but there's, yeah, there's certainly, yeah, it's as easy as doing that anywhere else, really. Yep. And again, there is a system for authentication, authorization for role base that's built into, as, St as Stephen talked about and showed, built into DataSnap. That you can that you can leverage and you can use attributes and, and calls but you can hook to any other api i mean whatever it might be you might have some other kind of system that you have uh, again you can write it in code on the data snap server and uh and hook that into the into the, the system that's built in or provide completely your own oh andre is asking fascinating demo what's the competition for. Okay, so yeah, great question. So um, I've managed to, um, I, I kind of went down to Jason's office and uh, twisted his arm, and uh, we've got a, a couple of um, Wowies um, that we're, well, we've got a few Wowies here that are branded up with Fireman Key on them. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a Wowie is, it's um, a kind of little box that you plug into your speaker and it turns any surface into a speaker. Um, it kind of you can attach it onto one of the windows or onto a desk, and it uses that for the base and uh, it gives off a really good sound. We've actually done uh, webinars, and when we had all the, uh, the the technical guys over here just before the launch of XE3 uh, in our office in Maidenhead, I think we had about 30 people mm -hmm. in, and the whole webinar uh, with Jose was done with a Wowie as the speaker, um, and they're kind of a little bit bigger than a. a a packet of cigarettes, uh, but it's it's a great little device. Um, what do you have to do and, to win? Yeah, so what, what you need to do for it um, is you need to download the code. You need to grab a copy of uh, XE3 Enterprise, so you've got data snap, and you need to have a play with the demo and design your own client. So there's the back-end engine there. There's a number of common files that you can you just pop into your application um, straight off that will go do the connection that will do the local caching for you and um, come up with an idea for, for doing a, a fun client um, and the back-end engine is you know, is so flexible there's so many different types of things you could do with it so we're just looking for people to, to have some fun with it and uh, uh, and be inventive and do you have on your blog you probably do uh, more information about uh, the competition and how to join it yeah I'll be getting that up um, okay. up through the day um, but yeah just basically uh, email through to me and um, yeah I'm guessing it's going to take a few more than a couple of hours for people to get some demos written um, but do get out there and, uh, and use this and as I say there'll be additional um, videos that I'll be posting up uh, probably a couple of weeks because I'm, I'm on the road quite a lot in the next couple of weeks but uh, we'll have some more videos coming up um, between now and Christmas and uh, you know, looking at different aspects of 
uh, of what's in the demo because there's so many different language features in there from class helpers to um, all the runtime type information and a whole load of other stuff. It'd be great just to, to deep dive into a few of those bits around the demo. So yep. if you get a chance to play with the demo and get to know it, then that will make those sessions a little bit more fun as well. Yeah, several people have commented about the completeness and the depth of the example and and they can't wait to watch the replay. I'll get that up as soon as possible. I'm recording this q and I'll slap it on the end. Um, and then when you get the replay, just put it in slow motion so you can really take it. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. But with full... Well, it's the one thing we always get asked when we're out on the road. It's like all the demos you do are kind of hello world demos showing kind of a little bit a little bit. Um, can you throw a whole lot of them together? And um, it's kind of difficult to get the time to do that sometimes. But uh, um, you know, luckily, you know, uh, we you have been able to, it's taken a few months to kind of uh, just a little, you know, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there to, to pull this demo together, but uh, hopefully it'll be a, a fun one that we can uh, come back to time and time again, so. Yeah, I just need, I'm trying to find, you know, I, I should bookmark this. I probably have somewhere, just, uh, I'm not on my own computer, but uh, Pavel has. Are you looking for, yeah, forward yeah. slash Delphi hyphen labs. Oh, sorry. Rad and action Delphi yeah. labs. You know, it's 11 labs. They're in. They're put in reverse order because they were chronological, most recent one. So you go to the bottom and you'll see first data snap server, then data snap with a database, server methods lifecycle. People were asking about different life cycles and server classes and so on. Server methods, um, testing them. Here's a whole thing on authentication and authorization. Uh, transports where you can filter to encryption, to compression of the JSON packet data. Uh, on you know that's the data that's inside the JSON packets. Uh, here's REST Web, uh, Web Broker jQuery Mobile Template Part One and Two, a data step server as a Windows service, uh, passing objects. People always ask, well, can I pass plain old C plus plus or Delphi objects? And so there you go. And then here's a here's the episode eleven about callbacks. And again, it says Delphi Exe, but it works in Exe two, Exe three. There's mm -hmm. just more things and 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 performance and and bug fixes and so on. Uh, our data snap applications. Well, Exe two actually. Yeah. So XE2. yeah, Exe two has actually had um, now has the ability for an Exe three has the ability to do multiple different callback channels, yep. um, which was pretty cool. And there's yep. I think there's the company tweak demo up on SourceForge um, yep. that's. Uh, that has that in there. Uh, and the one thing that Pavel has uh, said he's going to get onto his Delphi Labs at some point is uh, a little session about mobile connectors. And yep. uh, if you've not come across the mobile connector stuff yet, yeah, uh, we have and you're trying to convince your... Go ahead. Yeah, and, you, and you're trying to convince your boss to uh, to help push out and pay the extra to get uh, a copy of XE3. And then um, uh, some really interesting stuff that we've been looking at, especially with the, the whole emergence of the mobile stuff that's coming through, yep. is writing up the the, de uh, the data snap servers, and then being able to connect into them using, obviously, you know, the Delphi and C++ code we have now, but also iOS um, for uh, with Objective C, uh, with the, uh, uh, Java for Android and BlackBerry, uh, C Sharp for Windows Mobile, um, and uh, being able to hook through to those means you can literally just get any clients connecting in and uh, you know, testing your services in your back end once and then only having to worry about different clients connecting up to that middle tier is a is a huge big uh, benefit for using data snap as, a, as your back end yeah the uh, Scott is asking are data snap applications multi-threaded automatically yeah, so um, the data snap servers use to, um, a version of the indie components uh, on the server side, and they, by the very nature, are, are multi-threaded. So yeah. obviously, if you if you have something that's server state and you're um, you're going to be referencing that for multiple connections in, you may need to just check to make sure that uh, you protect that in some way. Um, but a really nice trick that I used on. Um, an application server that I wrote a few years back was uh, anything that I needed to keep global. I created as um, if I could into a client data set, and then each session that connected in, I just cloned the cursor to that client data set, created a client data set, cloned the cursor, and then I've got a thread safe um, connection to that um, set of data. And if it's changed anywhere else because I need to have lifetime notification around, the client data set would notify me through that um, change anyway. So that was quite a useful server side. Uh, trick. 
and there's also a, a pool. Uh, there's a pool setting on the data snap server that allows you to reuse and can keep these connections uh, or these threads alive. What is needed on the client side to access the built-in procedures? Is there other resources around the Delphi Labs? Uh, if you, I guess Alphas maybe, I mean, you're just calling procedures that you put in the public section of your server class, right? Yeah. So you just you create your TSQL connection and put it to the DataSnap driver, tell it where the DataSnap connection is, yeah. and um, and off it goes. Just go create the instance of the the server side class that you're wanting to use after you generate your DataSnap classes, um, which is all down in lesson one uh, on Pavel's uh, Delphi Labs. Yeah. Going through doing the simple calculator service that show you everything you need to know how to, yeah. to get going, um, and uh, yeah, from there off you go. Yep, just put uh, methods in the public section of, of any number of server classes that you want to create. You can have multiple server classes with different life cycles, right, for your server yeah. methods. Yeah, I used to um, separate up my business logic into different server-side classes. So I'd have one that always dealt with um, the kind of financial side of things, one that dealt with um, people, one that dealt with sales orders or, or whatever it was. And then I could um, plug and play my server side classes into different applications if I get them reasonably separated, which is quite cool. Yep. 